Hello, my name is Sam Stovall, and I'm the Chief Investment Strategist at CFRA Research. And I, David Holt, and Jeff Eliason are very happy to invite you and uh, welcome you to this webinar, talking about our investment outlook for the coming period, uh, which I have called Tis the Season, because we are on the precipice of the sell in May period, and questions abound as to whether the market has gone too fast, too far, and whether we are due for some sort of digestion of gains. Why don't we uh, move to the first slide, which tells you a little bit about who is speaking right now. Uh, CFRA, uh, which stands for the Center for Financial Research and Analysis, is an independent equity research firm uh, that focuses on fundamental as well as wealth management uh, research and forensic research. Uh, in addition, we are involved with mutual fund and ETF research and just recently acquired the Lowry Technical Advisory Service, so covering the waterfront in terms of independent uh, equity research. We also publish our findings uh, either electronically on Market Scope Advisor, uh, electronically and in print through the Outlook, our flagship publication that has been around since the early 1920s. So if you want to learn more about CFRA, please go to CFRAResearch.com, uh, read the information, and if you would like, please request a free trial to our Market Scope Advisor and Outlook platform, and that way see the kind of services that we have available. Well, enough of the uh, commercial interruptions. Let's move to the first slide to in a sense, tell you what we're gonna tell you, tell you, and then tell you what we told you. So in terms of the agenda, uh, talking about the milestones, uh, our target price, how did we get to this target price? What are some of the potential headwinds, as well as portfolio ideas, which is probably the reason that we are here today, is to come up with suggestions as to how you can invest for the future. In terms of milestones, even though this market has done exceptionally well and people are worried about some sort of a correction, uh, history says that while a correction could occur, we are still likely to see positive results for the full year. The S&P 500 set 10 new all-time highs through the middle of February. And interestingly enough, but looking at all uh, new highs in the first two months of the year going back to 1929, this was the 11th time that we had had such a strong start. So the question is, does this mean we've expended all of our fuel early on, or does it make for a running start for the rest of the year? Well, it ends up being the latter. With of those other you know, 10 other times in which the market uh, posted uh, the strongest uh, number of new highs, we were up an average of 16.3% in the full 12-month period. However, we did slip into a pullback or worse, meaning a decline of 5 to 10% or deeper uh, every time. And um, the, it typically occurred about 60 days after the end of February, which places us at the end of April, the beginning of the sell in May period, as well as the conclusion of the president's first 100 days in office. However, the first quarter's performance did the low point did not undercut the low point of December of 2020. We have had that happen uh, 39 times since World War II. And what I have found is that in those 39 times, on a total return basis, the market was positive all 39 times for the full calendar year. Only twice on a price only basis did the S&P 500 slip but in both cases, it slipped for the full year by less than one percentage point. So we do have something to look forward to if history holds true, and there's no guarantee it will. Our 12-month price target was set by basically looking at the cap-weighted target price differentials of all of the stocks in the S&P 500. Um, interesting that instead of it being a 12-month target, now it seems as if it should be a two-month target, meaning two months from now, since the market is advancing so sharply. But we get there because of historical precedent, looking at uh, typically what happens in the first year of a president's term in office, 
looking at the milestones that I mentioned above, looking at the analysts' forecasts. So obviously, um, we are going to be readdressing this target price once the first quarter earnings period has come to fruition. Potential headwinds, yes, even though uh, I am an optimist, and when life gives me lemons, I try to make whiskey sours, I do acknowledge that there are headwinds that we have to acknowledge. But we're going to come up with some ideas, hopefully, uh, that can help weather the uh, potential turmoil ahead. Let's go to the next slide just to see where we have been. Through the end of March, um, looking at uh, the styles, sizes, and sectors within the S&P 1500, since the last time we went through a decline of 5% or more, it was actually the S&P fell 9.6% through September 23rd. Since then, all sizes, styles, and sectors were in positive territory, up by double digits. And if you look at this number through the end of the 15th of April, the S&P was up almost 29%, not the near 23% that we show on the slide. Uh, but still, energy, financials, industrials, and materials were among the best performers since the latter part of September. I emphasize that because the next slide, which we won't go to yet, uh, shows something interesting as to which are the leading sectors today versus what I'll be showing you from a historical construct, uh, concept. Uh, we also find that 98% of these sub-industries, there are 147 sub-industries in the S&P 1500, and 98% of them are uh, up since the end of September. Let's go to the, second sl the next slide, and we will see that um, the, the reason I mentioned, uh, interestingly enough, that energy, financials, materials, and industrials were the four best performing sectors uh, since the September 23rd bottom matches up exactly with the best performing sectors typically uh, during a steepening yield curve environment since 1970. So interestingly, that uh, with the Fed saying that they're likely to keep their foot on the gas and not be raising interest rates this year or next. Uh, but with the market uh, thinking that with the economy expanding as sharply as it is, that there is a great likelihood that we could see a pickup in inflation. We do see the yield on the 10-year note creeping above the 0.93 closing level as of December 31st of 2020. Uh, not surprisingly, it's those sectors that perform the best when we do see a steepening yield curve, whereas the higher yielding, more defensive groups like consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, and real estate that, while still being positive, have underperformed the market. But why is it that the market still does uh, so well in spite of the COVID situation that, uh, that lingers? Let's go to the next slide, and we'll see, essentially, it's because uh, analysts are anticipating that economies are going to pop after last year's drop. In 2020, the globe saw a 3.5% shrinkage of real GDP led by the declines in the advanced economies over the emerging ones. U.S. Uh, was pretty much on target with the globe. Euro um, area ended up falling much more than the U.S. China, because it seems to have emerged more quickly from the COVID lockdowns, uh, was able to post a positive growth in 2020. But if we look to 2021, every one of those areas is expected to show growth anywhere from 3% up to 8.5%. So it's optimism toward global economic expansion that is helping. If we go to the next slide, we then also see that earnings are expected to rise to about 173 for the S&P 500 um, versus 140 or so in 2020, and then eclipse 200 uh, by 2022. Revenues are expected to rise by about 10% this year, almost 7% in 2022. I already talked about GDP growth, but our economists are not expecting runaway inflation. Core PCE year on year, yes, could be approaching and then exceeding slightly the Fed's target. However, this Fed said it would rather that it see inflation run hot for a while 
before it starts to raise short-term rates. So that's why we think that the Fed funds rate will stay where it is between zero and 25 um, basis points uh, before it starts to rise in 2023. The 10-year note, about uh, 180 for, uh, on average for 2021, which interestingly enough, we think will go up to about 195 during the second half of 2021 and then remain in that area for much of next year. So yes, higher yields, but not dramatically higher yields. And we also think that the US dollar, uh, this is the Fed's uh, indicator of the US dollar versus global basket of other currencies, essentially remaining fairly flat for this year and next year. Uh, but oil prices are likely to benefit from the expansion of the global economy and average about $62 this year and in the low $70 per barrel area next year. In the next slide, we see that it's not just an economic growth pattern, but also an earnings improvement expectation. Whether you look to the US, the developed international or the emerging markets, as we see in the gray bars, that's for 2021 forecast, 23.4% here in the US, 44.5 for developed international, and 35.1 for emerging markets. And then we also see mid to low teens growth for 2022. So expectations remain fairly solid. Uh, and as a result, we have seen very strong improvement in share prices since the uh, end of September of last year. And certainly as we are moving into um, 2021, indeed, uh, under President Biden, we have now seen 19 new all-time highs, which is the second highest for all presidents since World War II. But if we go to the next slide, we see that there are actually some worries out there. The S&P 500's market cap to nominal GDP uh, is around 140% versus the average of 62%. So essentially uh, being very high versus its long-term average. Margin debt uh, also at an all-time high compared with either the S&P 500 uh, market cap or nominal GDP. Recently, the Russell 2000 was 40% above its 200-day moving average, which was the highest on record since the index was created in the late 1970s. We saw in the latter part of 2020 that growth stocks did so well that it, the growth minus value differential, meaning the 12-month return for growth minus the 12-month return for value, was the highest on record even above where we were in the late 1990s. Also, right now, we're looking at 99% of the sub-industries in the S&P 1500 above their 200-day moving average. Yes, that's good from a breadth perspective, meaning you have a broad participation, probably does not um, point to a bear market anytime soon, but it does seem that if everybody, if you will, is already invested, then who's left to push share prices higher might end up making the market vulnerable to some sort of digestion of gains. And also valuations. 10 of 11 sectors in the S&P are trading at double digit premiums to their long-term average NTM or next 12 month PE ratios. Um, and actually uh, this slide is out of date because the S&P is not trading at a 37% premium to its long-term average. As of today, it is trading at a 42% premium to its long-term average. And lastly, I don't know if this has happened to you, but it's happened to me a few times. I get telephone calls from nieces, from nephews, from neighbors who never invested in stocks before and ask me, gee, how do I get involved in investing? I wanna get a part of the action. So now I know how Joseph Kennedy or Bernard Baruch felt in 1929 when they were getting stock market advice from their shoeshine person. So maybe we are getting a little bit frothy at this point. Digging a little bit deeper, let's go to the next slide and you can see why there is some concern from a valuations perspective. What I'm showing here are the 10 sectors in the 11 sectors in the S&P 500. The 500 itself, 
its growth and value components, mid and small cap indices, as well as developed international and emerging markets. First column shows the current PE ratio. The second is the average. And then the third on the right-hand side is the premium or the discount. And this was data as of March 31st. And you can see that everyone except healthcare is in double digits with the low one being financials at a 17% premium and consumer discretionary at the high point at almost a 90% premium. So it comes to a point when you sort of wonder, do the dials need to be reset? Let's move to the next slide. One of the things that has been of concern recently is, okay, how does the market tend to perform whenever we're in a rising inflationary environment? Well, you can download the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS.gov, and get the CPI, the headline CPI since 1948, the core CPI since 1958. What I did was I went back to 48, looking at the headline CPI on a year-over-year -year basis, and then looked at the, the high, the average, and the low for each decade since then. The average for all decades is three and a half percent. So that is the, uh, the typically the year on year percent change in inflation since 1948, three and a half percent. The high water mark was in the 1970s at almost eight percent. And that was the reason that Paul Volcker raised interest rates to the point to choke off inflationary growth and help, hence brought us down to below 2% in the 2010s. So history says that in these quintiles of headline CPI readings, that whenever the market or whenever inflation has been below 3.5% on a monthly gain, yeah, you continue to see improvements in the S&P 500, just at a decelerating rate of pace as inflation rises and the line in the sand tends to be around three and a half percent after which the market on average tends to fall. Yet with us starting at such a low level, should we see a spike in inflation that is not temporary, meaning it's not just a three and a half percent increase in CPI as is anticipated by our economists in the second quarter, um, if it tends to last into the third and fourth quarters, that could be a problem in our opinion, um, because expectations are that inflation will be temporary. And as a result, that's why the bull market will continue. Let's go to the next slide, because the question is frequently raised. Well, if we do go into a decline of 10% or more, which are the areas that are likely to get hit the hardest? Well, interestingly enough, going back to 1995, which is as far back as S&P has sector and sub-industry level data, what I did was I looked at those periods prior, six months prior to declines of 10% or more. On average, the S&P 500 gained 15.5%. The three best performing sectors rose 22.4%. And the top 10 performing sub-industries were up almost 46%. Not surprisingly, it was then these three best sectors and 10 top sub-industries that took it on the chin when the market did eventually slip into the decline of 10% or more. When the market fell on average 23.8%, those three best performing sectors were off nearly 32% and the top 10 sub-industries declined by almost 44%. Of course, there's no guarantee that's going to happen this time, but it does uh, go to show that if you have that much more profit, that much more gain than other areas, that's where investors are going to seek to re uh, to capture those gains uh, once the market starts to weaken. So where are some of the areas of strength right now that could be vulnerable should we slip into a decline? Let's take a look at uh, my last slide showing a rolling 12-month relative strength for sectors and indices within the S&P 1500. I'm showing you six charts here. Let's take a look at the top left, the S&P 500 energy sector. Each of the jagged black lines is a 52-week look back. 
how did the S&P 500 energy sector perform in that 52 weeks versus the S&P 500? It's plotted out. If it's above 100, then it means that the, the sector beat the market. If it's below 100, then it means that the sector underperformed the market. And those two black horizontal lines are one standard deviation above and below the mean. Well, you can see that through around the end of 2020, energy was more than two standard deviations below the mean, yet has uh, ex exhibited uh, like a moon launch uh, skyrocketing up past one standard deviation above the mean, leaving its moving average in the dust, this being a 40 week or 200 day moving average which is probably around two standard deviations still below the mean. So like General Patton uh, charging ahead, getting too far ahead of its supply lines, he needed to slow down in order for those fuel, uh, ammo, uh, and uh, food to catch up with his troops. So that's what we're probably going to see when we do have a digestion of gains, that it's those recent outperformers that are likely to pause, come back to their moving average uh, before advancing once again. Industrials in the middle, top middle, also went from one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above. We've seen similar moves for materials, and as we see on the far right-hand side, a very sharp advance for the S&P small cap 600. Where have we not been seeing uh, growth in equity prices? as the original chart on a steepening yield curve shows that traditionally consumer staples, healthcare have not been great performers in this kind of an environment. And sure enough, again, they have been underperformers, but you do have to wonder whether they've been beaten up too much uh, during this recent advance into the uh, low quality areas of the market. And as we see on the bottom right-hand side, that since the beginning of this year, after the growth minus value differential got about two standard deviations above the mean, it has now exhibited the glide path of a crowbar and is coming down to about the 100 level. But since it's still above the 100 level, that means that growth continues to outperform value on a rolling 12 month basis. So where do we go from here? I'm gonna pass it over to David Holt who will talk to us about the different model portfolios that CFRA and PEAK can offer. Hey, hey thanks, Sam. Uh, really appreciate it. So like all other calls that we've had prior, uh, we'll actually cycle through some of the portfolios that I do oversee with intrinsic value, which is a quantitative rules-based portfolio, and then high-quality capital appreciation, um, an actively managed portfolio, but this time with a twist, which I'll actually get into in the next three slides. Now on slide 15 and jumping right in, uh, no way around it, the latter end of 2020 and so far to really start 2021 um, has been a big learning experience to say the least. So to really to help articulate that notion and for anyone really tuning in and listening to this recording, I'd like to group the next three slides in tandem uh, given the cross currents that we're are readily apparent in today's market, which uh, we believe helps really establish the narrative why both portfolios have trailed benchmarks by, by such wide margins uh, so far this year. So originally, um, we added this slide last quarter to establish uh, the investment style for each respective portfolio, uh, where we will actually conduct a standard regression analysis to, to show how tightly correlated each portfolio is uh, to different flavors of companies, whether it be uh, growth, value, large cap, or small caps. Uh, likewise, I think this also helps you as a client um, or a potential client to help determine which portfolio has the right risk tolerance for you as an investor. So uh, really speaking of market risk, uh, both intrinsic value and high quality capital appreciation are both more so risk adverse and really postured in a defensive fashion. So uh, it's more geared towards larger cap, lower bid in names, um, but you've seen those lag so far this year. Um, although with high quality capital appreciation, um, that's more so straddling the line between value and growth. Um, as you can see in the right-hand side of this chart, 
uh, the regressions still fall within the Russell 1000. So that's more so weighted towards market caps of roughly $450 billion and above. And we're talking, you know, names like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Berkshire. So uh, two of which are actually in the portfolio. Um, in a market that really rewards uh, weaker balance sheets and lower quality names, this slide really does sum up why portfolios have lagged versus their benchmark so far this year. All right, so a continuation to slide 15, um, now on 16. So again, this really helps sum up uh, what super excessive liquidity from the Federal Reserve really does with the multiple rounds of stimulus that you've seen, uh, given in, in our opinion, it misprices risk to some extent. So as a result, investors have really had to embrace uh, beta heavy names further out in the risk curve, uh, which we've actually highlighted and called out um, in this slide. Um, all in really an effort to just keep up with your benchmark. Unfortunately, um, requirements for each of these portfolios, which I'll actually touch on with later slides, don't really allow us uh, to follow that herd and venture out further on the risk curve. So what's so interesting, um, you're still in a, a TINA or there is no other alternative like market environment. So um, really every place you go, um, bonds devalue with rate increases, and um, it's not really a good place to be without a further move upward in rates. And then you look to the other end of the spectrum with growth stocks, which are still struggling, um, especially with rates rising too fast. Um, and then you've also had value stocks um, that have really gained a lot of ground so far this year and could be you know, toppy at current levels. Um, and then lastly, when you look at cash, it's being devalued with inflation and monetary policy. So it seems like no matter where you turn, there's there's a high risk. So why not stay the course and, and go with what's working? Um, it's, it seems to be the general consensus right now. Okay, so this is my favorite slide. Um, and we just actually recently added this for the presentation. I'm on slide 17. So another illustration of how violent uh, this dash to trash has actually been with the move from high quality names to lower quality names. Uh, what we did here is took the entire universe of stocks within S&P Capital IQ um, within that had quality rankings. It came out to about 1100 names and grouped them in either a high quality bucket, A minus or better, or low quality bucket, B plus or below. Um, with regards to price performance, it's, it's pretty easy to see how steep um, the gap has been between the two. It's been a 40 point gap uh, between the two groups from a year to year snapshot. Um, but that gap that you've seen on the far right hand side of the slide has actually closed uh, slowly but surely. And this will actually be touched on again um, as we get into performance in um, some later slides. But um, by no means am I calling a bottom or a top in the market or investment styles. After all, that's that's Sam's job. But the data is really telling us that at some point, I think investor focus could shift uh, from lower quality, highly levered names further out in that risk curve to higher quality uh, companies. You know, that's after the initial burst of economic growth really starts to taper off and interest rates uh, settle down as well. So I'm now on slide 18. Uh, I like this slide because it really underscores the key factors of, of how we screen for companies that are either added or removed from intrinsic value. So again, a quant-driven portfolio that's rebalanced every March and September. So the portfolio recently rebalanced last month, um, which had a large uptick in holdings uh, to 82 total um, from 59, and it was comprised of 49 existing positions and 33 new. So I think what you really saw was, was many of these names that were excluded in prior periods, uh, more recently qualified given the rosier economic backdrop, which really um, put upward pressure on fundamentals. And you started to see that soak through forward estimates. So I think I read somewhere from one of Sam's most recently published reports that we're now expecting a 16% year to year increase in EPS across S&P 500 companies uh, heading into Q1 which is really apparent with the, with the recent rebalance that we've seen. So transitioning to slide 19 uh, with the screen criteria for high quality appreciation. So I think the name itself sums it up. 
And I really won't bore you with another Robinson Crusoe analogy like I did last quarter, but the bottom line from this specific portfolio, we look for names that can offer a long-term capital appreciation through the sustainable um, high quality companies that offer the best uh, balance of risk and reward. So companies with durable earnings and cash flow profiles, uh, sound balance sheets, and, and wide moats with competitive advantages. But last but not least, and something I really look for, is companies with proven management teams um, that actually may re remain ideal candidates for entry into this portfolio. So coupled with that screen criteria itself and vetting that um, we do as a team and individually, um, outlined on the left-hand side of this slide, the most definitive figure um, is the quality ranking that's needed uh, to be entered in the portfolio, which is A minus or better. So by now, I hope I've really conveyed my point, uh, but the quality ranking really embeds that natural defensive posture into the portfolio um, geared towards both growth and capital preservation, um, which I've discussed at ad nauseum, but, but has really worked against us recently. So turning to slide 20, uh, we have performance of how the portfolio is done versus its benchmark over uh, different time periods. So intrinsic value performance remains a standout from a longer term perspective, and that's from a three, five, and 10 year purview. So here is really the point I try, try to drive home from a short and medium term perspective. From a one year standpoint, the portfolio has underperformed, but if you remember from the highlights um, earlier in, the, in my section, uh, the portfolio itself has actually held up pretty well, all things considered, given the flavor of companies that are usually um, screened and added or subtracted um, from this portfolio and given the market environment that we're in currently. And now moving to slide uh, 21 with um, the doozy, uh, high quality capital appreciation. So automatically we'll pivot to the one year time span here, but as you can see, the underperformance has been acute, um, but if you remember from the exercise that we conducted on slide 17 uh, with low quality versus high quality, it's actually done a bit better than the gap in between the two buckets in its entirety. So um, also I just checked uh, for the current month um, so far, which would be uh, April, um, the portfolio is actually outperforming by about 100 basis points. So hopefully that can hold and we can really expand from here and it would move in concert with some of Sam's comments um, from earlier in the presentation. Moving to my last slide. Um, and if you've tuned in to hear prior updates, uh, you've seen me use this set of data points that the quant team has put together. Um, so thanks to them again. But market up and down capture rates uh, remain largely unchanged from uh, both, both portfolios, especially with intrinsic value. Um, and that's with the blue bars capturing more than its fair share of returns during up markets, but also helping to preserve capital during down days. So um, only capturing about 85% of that total market downside. High quality has also followed a similar path, but just not as tightly correlated um, in up, up market scenarios uh, for reasons that we've, we've went over. Uh, but like prior updates, I've also included um, a few new data, data points under char characteristics under the bottom portion of the slide with uh, general stats around earnings multiples and dividend yields for each specific portfolio. So additionally, um, we've also noted the batting averages are holding up here um, despite some of the recent underperformance, but I think that's more so attributed to the recent stint of outperformance that you've seen um, from both of these portfolios. So. Um, in closing, I really do hope uh, this overview and really what we're seeing um, and really how we evaluate each portfolio was, was helpful. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff to wrap up the call. David and Sam, thank you so much for sharing your insight. As we at Peak Capital speak with advisors, they are faced with clients uh, that may have missed the recovery. Other may, others may have participated in the, in the recovery but the volatility was gut-wrenching. And everyone currently is just wringing their hands, contemplating a prudent approach forward in a post-COVID world under the Biden administration. Emotions are running high amidst this uncertainty. We do know that a rules-based disciplined approach to investing can assist 
in mitigating risk while seeking consistent returns. Peak Capital has the honor of making CFRA's research available to advisors and their clients as managed solutions through managed account platforms. If you would like to learn more about access to those models, leveraging CFRA's research and best thinking, please do not hesitate to contact me directly via phone or email uh, with my contact info listed on this slide. If we move forward to the disclosure slides, uh, I can close things out. Uh, again, Sam and David, thank you for your time today. We will look forward to continuing to serve the advisor community with you both and your team at CFRA. Hopefully, we get back on the road soon and enjoy seeing everyone in person. Until then, take care and stay safe.